Hello lovelies, in this video we're going to be looking at deep oceans and surface coral reefs for your AQA A-level in environmental science. A-level environmental science, topic one, the living environment. Lesson nine, deep ocean and surface coral reefs. Shallow coral reefs are found in equatorial regions along the coastline. Coral reefs, ecological features. The first ecological feature that you need to know about is the fact that the coral reefs are classified in the phylum Cnidaria. You may have looked at classification at GCSE, but if not, classification is grouping organisms based on evolutionary relationships. The classification system we use, going from largest category to smallest, is domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus and species. We call this a hierarchy, as an organism can only belong to one of each level, with no overlap. The smaller categories have smaller numbers of organisms in it, until species is of course species specific, so only one group of organisms found there. An organism's Latin name comes from its genus and species together, for example, Homo sapien, humans, where Homo is the genus and sapien is the species. The organism's grouped as cnidarians has stinging cells called nematocysts and are aquatic species. They tend to also be soft-bodied. Corals obtain nutrients in a few different ways. The first being they use their nematocysts to kill plankton to eat. They have their tiny hair-like extensions called cilia, which are thought to help manipulate the water flow and help them obtain nutrients from the water. They also have algae living inside their cells called zooxanthellae, which photosynthesize and supply the coral with sugars in return for shelter and carbon dioxide. As they rely on photosynthesis for a large proportion of their nutrition, corals require a set of very specific abiotic factors in order to survive. They need high light levels to ensure the zooanthellae are able to photosynthesize as well as warm, stable temperatures. A low turbidity also ensures the light is able to penetrate the water and reach the coral. They are also limited to the depth at which they can go. They must remain in the photic zone, which is the depth at which light can penetrate the water. Lower than this is known as the aphotic and would not be suitable. Corals also require a fairly high salinity to survive. If any of these abiotic factors move out of the coral's narrow range of tolerance, it causes stress and as a result, the zooanthellae will leave their cells causing bleaching. Bleached corals, named so they lose their bright colouring when this happens, cannot survive for very long without the zooanthellae as it was their main source of nutrition. Unfortunately, we are currently seeing mass bleaching events across shallow reefs due to changes we are seeing to our climate. What's the importance of the coral reef ecosystems? Firstly, coral reefs are a huge biodiversity hotspot. Despite them covering a tiny proportion of the ocean, over a quarter of marine species either live there, visit, or rely on the resources found there. They are an important habitat for lots of fish species, as well as hunting grounds for others. As a result, humans also rely on them heavily as commercial fishing spots for multiple species of fish, mollusk, and crustacean. Due to the vast number of species living here, there are lots of predator-prey relationships and competitor relationships. Consequently, a lot of species have developed chemical defence mechanisms, which can often be trialled for use in medicine. For example, the sea hair releases a toxic chemical that can stop cells from dividing. Another reason they are such valuable ecosystems is the part they play in climate control. As coral reefs grow, they are a vital carbon sink as their exoskeletons are made of calcium carbonate, CaCO3, which requires carbon during its production. They also act as important barriers to the erosion of the coastline. Some of the larger coral reefs have irregular and complicated structures that help to dissipate the energy of the waves before they hit the coastline, therefore reducing the eroding power as they are absorbing the wave's energy. Furthermore, pieces of broken coral also help to form sand on the shore, which also protects against the wave's power. Finally, coral reefs are huge tourism spots. People flock from all over the world to see them and the biodiversity they support. Snorkeling and diving around coral reefs are very popular activities. As the reefs are under threat, even more people want to see them before they no longer have the chance to. So tourism increases despite the ecosystem vulnerability. 
Whilst the tourism industry is beneficial as it creates jobs for locals and brings money into the area that can be spent on conservation, it can also be a threat. During their visits, people take mementos home such as pieces of coral, they trample the coral and they burn fossil fuels to power the visitor boats. What are the other threats to the coral reef? Sedimentation is a big threat to coral reefs. This is where sediments such as dust and dirt from turbid rivers or construction on land ends up in the ocean and covers the corals. This prevents the light from reaching the zooanthellae so they can no longer photosynthesize, leading to bleaching. There are lots of other pollutants that you can find in the ocean that have the same effect, such as oil and litter. Furthermore, if there is a farm near the coastline, then fertilizers and pesticides can run off the land once applied and end up in the ocean. The fertiliser can cause algal blooms on the surface, which block the light, whereas pesticides can be toxic. We are also seeing a large increase in the acidity of the ocean, as more carbon dioxide enters the atmosphere and dissolves in the seawater. This lowered pH makes it more difficult for corals to calcify their exoskeletons. As we rely so heavily on our reefs for the fishing industry, it has inevitably become a threat as well. This is because we have been harvesting individuals at a faster rate than the population is able to replenish itself. This is called overfishing. Not only does this affect the species we are fishing, but also those that rely on them as a food source or habitat, meaning their populations will also decline. We are also seeing introduced species from ballast water, fish farming and the aquarium trade becoming an issue. There are lots of examples where they have become invasive either as a predator or competitor and dwindled the populations of native species. An example of this is the red lionfish, which got released into the Caribbean from the aquaria trade and has since become a predator to many indigenous species. Being invasive means it will have no or very few natural predators in the reef and an abundance of food, leading to spikes in population size. How can we conserve the coral reef? As mentioned earlier, tourists would remove pieces of coral for souvenirs. This is being reduced by the organisation CITES, Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species. They have added over 2,000 species of coral to Appendix 2 of the programme, so trade is now heavily regulated and controlled. Efforts are also being made to designate coral reefs and their surrounding waters as protected areas such as MPA, Marine Protected Area. The Great Barrier Reef in Australia has been established as a national park. These designations will prevent any damaging activities and encourage more sustainable use such as no-take zones and ecotourism. In some areas where bleaching has been severe, scientists have been trialling the establishment of artificial reefs. These can be made from a multitude of materials such as old ships or concrete and it is hoped that corals can establish themselves on these materials. This would then allow all of the other species to use it as a habitat. We are now going to look at deep ocean reefs, which are very different. Where tropical corals can only be found in warm, shallow coastal waters, deep reefs can be found on seabeds across the globe. As they are not found in shallow waters, the water is dark and much colder. As a result, they do not have zooanthellae as photosynthesis would not be possible. This, coupled with the low nutrient availability, means they have a much slower growth rate than tropical corals. The importance of deep ocean reefs. These ecosystems are important as some have only been discovered fairly recently, since 2010 for example, which means there hasn't been much time to research them extensively. This could mean there are potential resources here that are yet to be discovered like new medicine. They also support a large number of fish species who also tend to have a slow growth rate, therefore they are an essential habitat. Some of these species are now fished commercially as we deplete the populations of traditional stock, for example, cod. Threats. They are very vulnerable to overfishing due to their growth rate and breeding patterns and therefore fishing is a huge threat. As these corals are found on the seabed, they are particularly vulnerable to the fishing method of deep sea trawling where a net is dragged along the seabed. This damaging activity destroys the reef and due to their slow growth, it can take hundreds of years to recover. Another threat is the expansion of oil and gas exploration as other reserves become depleted. This requires drilling into the seabed. This could also lead to future oil spills which are toxic. In order to try and protect these incredibly delicate ecosystems, protected areas have been established to stop any damaging activities. There is also a large focus on educating people about their importance as they are often overlooked when compared to their tropical relatives. 
So we have now finished looking at coral reefs. It is important that you can distinguish between the two as you may be asked to compare them in the exam. Ouch! This is why in some videos I explain scratches.